Hi, I'm Siobhan Sarna. I'm so glad you're here to learn about the skin microbiome and transient versus permanent uh, organisms. Is that the right word? Organisms. Sure, yeah, that, yes, that is the right word. Thank goodness Karen Krishnan is here to talk more about that. Karen, you may know from uh, Microbiome Labs, he co founded that. You'll may be familiar with Megaspore Probiotic for the inside of us and many other formulations. He, he holds world patents. He's just completed the announcement of his first gut microbiome course. I'll tell you a little bit about that later in case you're interested because it's a, they're wrapping it up for enrollment tomorrow. And we're going to talk about SIV. It's like an IV for your skin. He calls it SIV. I call it SIV. You can call it whatever you want. But the science is emerging about the skin microbiome and how it impacts not just how you look, but also your overall health. Remarkable information. I'm going to wrap up my intro so we can get to it. Thanks for being here. My company is Chronic Condition Rescue. I've had a very important emphasis on my skin since I was on TV for so long. Uh, this whole message of being aspirational for literally decades. Part of the thing I'm trying to do is educate you on your health, your wisdom, being a great person. The outside is important, but it's not as important as what's inside and feeling great. So there you go. That's part of my personal philosophy. Karen, have at it, my friend. Thank you so much for this. New death of course. messages. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me as usual. Um, it's it's uh, wonderful to be able to speak about this, and I'll I'll go into some slides here in a second. But uh, before I do that, I I want to you know preface this by saying that it's it it really is important for people to start thinking about their skin in a different way than we normally think about the skin, right? Um, I think most people on here are fairly health conscious people, which means that you're thinking about different parts of your body or your body as a whole um, from a from a health perspective. There are things we do to protect our gut. There are things we do to protect our heart, our brain, our, you know, gallbladder, our eyes, all of these components of our body, all of these organ systems, <clears throat> we focus on protecting them. With the skin, outside of UV damage, right? I think a lot of people are on board with using some form of SPF if they're going to be in the sun. Um, but outside of that, we don't often think about our skin as an organ that needs protecting and needs constant monitoring and protecting uh, in, you know, in that light. Um, we, we are concerned about what our skin looks like, and, and therefore we have more of a, um, a cosmetic um, relationship with the skin. It's really about the skin looking good. The problem with that is that there are many ways of making the skin look good, even if it's a facade, right? Even if the underlying skin is not as healthy as it used to be or is incurring change that you don't like, there's ways of overcoming that with, you know, personal care products and makeups and 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 Botox and, you know, uh, fillers and all of these kinds of things that we can do. And, and they're fine, right? Like, if that's what people need to do to feel better about themselves, I, I'm, I would never judge anyone for that. But I would also want people to understand that their skin is a very important organ. And as a result, we have to take care of it and we have to look at it from a health and functionality standpoint. Because it, as it turns out, Unhealthy skin not only looks unhealthy in the ways we understand, so inflamed, you know, acne, eczema, psoriasis, all of these kind of inf inflammatory things that we don't want on our skin, all the way to age-related conditions, right? Fine lines, wrinkles, hyperpigmentation, in larger pores, dryness of the skin, thinning of the skin, those are all not just inconvenient appearances on the skin. They are actually signs and symptomology of the underlying skin being wholly unhealthy. And when your skin is unhealthy, it actually becomes an independent risk factor for chronic disease. Your skin is connected to your bone health. Your skin is connected to cardiovascular health. Your skin is connected to brain health. And that's what we're starting to find out now. And at the at the root of all of this is your skin microbiome. 
right? As your skin microbiome becomes dismantled and starts to change, it changes the function of your skin. It changes how your skin looks. And then eventually it also causes the skin to be a driver of chronic disease, right? That's a very important thing to keep in mind because I want everybody to look their best and feel their best about how they look. I want that for myself as well. But if we can do that, by improving the health of the skin, then not only are we improving our self-image and how and our confidence and all that, but we're actually protecting ourselves against dysfunction, chronic dysfunction in the body uh, for areas completely outside of the skin, right? So <clears throat> that's my preface. And let me jump in here and share my presentation. And then if for some reason this doesn't look correctly, it doesn't look correct, sorry, or looks too small or anything, somebody jump in and let me know. Um, if not, I will just continue. Good. Looks good. Looks good. Okay, awesome. Um, so I want to talk about the impact of biome balancing. So balancing the skin microbiome, right? And when um, we created a technology that can help you do that, and there's other things that you need to be doing as well, and, and I'll, I'll share with that, but but SIV is one of those tools that can really help balance and correct the imbalance within your microbiome. Um, this is what it looks like, and I'll talk a little bit more about the product itself once we get once we get past the effect of balancing the skin microbiome. Um, one of the key things to really understanding, you know, how the skin microbiome shapes, and and let me actually, I'm going to jump to, sorry, let me jump to a different slide here. I thought I'd change the slides. But for some reason, it jumps to this, jumps to this slide. All right. OK. OK, hopefully you see that. Good? No, you're not sharing your screen anymore. Oh, I'm not. OK, let me. Go back to screen share. Popping on and saying you hi. Sure? You got it. It's a coming. It's coming, guys. Sorry, I got to move my cursor back over here. Okay. Okay, you see our skin ecology? Yes, it's gorgeous. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, this is where it was supposed to go. I don't know why I jumped to like slide seven. Um, so this is the, the, the important part of the foundation, right? So let's learn a little bit uh, about our skin microbiome. So we've got about um, 20 square, square feet or so of skin on our bodies, which represents, of course, one of the largest organ systems. We do think of our skin as a definitive barrier, um, it is a much more um, hardened barrier than other barrier systems that we've talked about, which is like the lining of the gut. So, you know, we, we talk a lot about leaky gut and, and the um, barrier dysfunction of the lining of the intestinal tract. The intestinal tract is a much more dynamic barrier, meaning it's supposed to allow a lot more things through, like nutrients and so on. Um, and then and then it's supposed to prevent certain things from getting uh, through the lining and into the circulation. And, and that's why it's designed in a different way by nature. The skin, however, is much more of a brick wall type of barrier, meaning it's got many, many layers to it, not just one cell layer like the lining of our gut. It's got multiple layers to it, and it's got, um, you know, very complex kind of immunological uh, systems within it so that the immune system can get a sense of what the host is experiencing in the environment around you. And a lot of that translation is happening through the microbes that are sitting on the skin. And so we do want the skin to act as a definitive barrier. And when the skin's barrier system starts to falter, that's when we start to see this issue of leaky skin and then all the risks that come along with it, right? And I promise I will elaborate on that more. So on the skin, we've got around one and a half trillion 
resident bacteria. So just think about the volume of that that's on the skin. We can have upwards of a thousand different species. There's about a 35 to one ratio of skin cells to microbes. So for every skin cell you have, you have about 35 microbes on the skin. So you have much more in terms of microbes on the skin than your own skin cells, right? So that clearly shows this very important role of the microbes on the skin, uh, even compared to our own skin cells. The most common genera on the skin are Propionin bacterium and Cornium bacterium. Then you have Staphylococci, Streptococci, and a number of others. The Propionin bacterium and Cornium bacterium, keep that in mind. We'll revisit that as we talk about some of the functions of the skin as it relates to the microbiome, because there's a very definitive um, change in functionality when you flip between these two groups of bacteria. Now we've got transient microbes on the skin and we've got resident microbes, right? So think about those, those uh, 1.5 trillion resident microbes on the skin. They actually don't make up 100% of all the bacteria on the skin. They make up somewhere around 75 to 80% of the bacteria on the skin. The other 20% that you find at any given moment on your skin are what we call transient microbes, meaning they're hopping onto the skin typically from the outside environment or in contact with other individuals as you're, you know, as you touch and rub against other people, um, you know, surfaces, pets, all of these things, um, you're going to end up getting certain microbes jumping onto the skin. Now, those microbes that jump onto the skin are transient because they don't stay permanently on the skin. They jump on, many of them jump on, they don't do anything at all, and then they just jump off. Uh, some of them jump on and can actually influence and control some aspects of the resident microbes, right? So these are the very important quorum sensing transient microbes. That's a very important concept to keep in mind and learn is that some of the microbes that jump on the skin have the ability to affect what the resident microbes look like and also how the immune system is dealing not only with the resident microbes, but also with the stimuli that's appearing on the skin, right? Our skin is constantly affected by stimuli from the outside environment, whether it's contact things, like things rubbing against the skin, like your clothes or your backpack straps, or you know the, the wall you're leaning on or your bed sheets or your, you know, all of the things that rub up against your skin on a day-to-day -day basis, or the air that we are in, that's in a given room, right? Or in another individual, or, it's chemical exposure to things that are in the atmosphere that are landing on the skin or microbes that are landing on the skin, or of course, UV radiation, magnetism, all of these other things that we can't really see with our eyes, but we know are out there and are um, landing and impacting our skin. So the, so the transient microbes that are quorum sensing microbes are unique in that they have a way of effectuating the permanent resonance and they have a way of affecting how the microbiome, uh, sorry, how the immune system on the skin in, uh, is response to all of the stimuli that the skin is getting. Right? That's an important concept here. Now, when you look at eco ecology of different sites on the body, so when you look at the face, the face is considered a sebaceous area of the body, meaning it's very oily, right? You've got large pores, you've got large sebaceous glands, producing a lot of oils. And so the face has a lot of anaerobic environments because those pores that are full of oils, they tend to be devoid of oxygen. There's a lot of cre uh, creps and a lot of little um, you know, lines and things and crevices where you can get oil impacted there and you end up with an anaerobic environment. So certain groups of bacteria do well on a healthy face because these bacteria do well in the presence of fats and oils and they also do well in the in an anaerobic environment, which is an oxygen-free environment. I know it's hard to think of your face, which is sitting here exposed to the air where there's oxygen all around, but there are areas, a lot of areas in your face, on your microenvironments in your face that are anaerobic. And so Propionin bacterium is a type of bacteria that likes fat and likes fatty acid and does well in an anaerobic environment. That's why in a, in a normal, healthy face, you tend to have larger amounts of a group of bacteria called propionin bacteria, right? And then if that starts to shift, you're starting to start, you're starting to see a shift in how the skin on your face starts to look. Now, in the other parts of your body, like your arms, your back, your legs, these are considered 
drier areas of the body. They're not sebaceous areas. They're not super oily. Um, they don't have the same anaerobic environments. And so you tend to have a much higher diversity of microbes on this part of your skin. You, you can have upwards of a thousand different species of bacteria on your arms and legs and lower back and so on. You can have propionin bacterium, staphylococcus, micrococcus, corneum bacterium, streptococcus, all these different groups of bacteria. Uh, and some individuals will even have mold and fungus and other things growing on their skin, right? So different ecosystems, different types of bacteria as a result of those different ecosystems. Now we are without surprise, constantly disrupting the microbiome of our skin, just like we disrupt the microbiome of our gut and everything else that, that you know, all the other ecosystems that are in and on us. Now, some of the things that are big drivers of changes to the microbiome of your skin is, is age. So as you age, the microbes start to change on your skin. That's in part a, a slightly normal shift. However, that shift is perpetuated and accelerated by choices that we make, right? And I'll talk about one of the shifts that occurs uh, with age and how that drives aging of the skin in a couple of slides. But keep in mind that as you age, naturally the microbes are going to start to change, which means it's even more important as you're aging to rebalance the microbiome of the skin, right? Uh, this is why when you're younger, your skin is much more resilient to things. And then as you get older, your skin is much more sensitive to things because of the shifting microbiome on the skin. Gender has um, a lot of impact as well because hormones play a role in impacting the skin. Estrogen in particular is really good for the skin, right? When, when women have adequate levels of estrogen, um, you know, before menopause, um, and in their, you know, uh, childbearing ages and all that. And then as after they hit pu puberty, um, estrogen is very softening to the skin. It improves a glow in the skin. Uh, estrogen upregulates collagen and elastin function, which gives you the tautness in your skin and reduces the amount of wrinkles and fine lines that you have. Estrogen is also anti-inflammatory in the skin. Um, it has, it does a number of functions on the skin, right? And so that's why as you age, one of the things to think about is maybe an estrogen cream for the skin. Um, uh, it's typically an es uh, estriol, estradiol uh, cream can be very beneficial for uh, people in their perimenopause and postmenopause age because estrogen is so important for the skin. Uh, we know testosterone can actually have an inflammatory effect on the skin and so when, you know, when you've got people that take uh, performance enhancing steroids, one of the side effects of that is they get a lot of acne on their body, on their face and so on. Uh, testosterone can have that, that negative impact, that inflammatory impact. So that is a factor. Genetics plays a role. Genetics plays a smaller role than most of these other factors, but it does have a role. The environment you live in has a huge impact. The amount of pollutants in your environment, the types of pollutants in your environment, those all have a huge impact on your skin. In, in particular, think about um, compounds like phthalates, right? So phthalates are compounds that are, that are uh, very present in fragrances and a lot of synthetic um, creams and lotions and all that. Anything that has a fragrance or fake coloring in it, um, those phthalates have a huge ability to interfere with neurological processes in the brain, especially the metabolism of uh, tryptophan into things like serotonin and melatonin. So it can dramatically increase stress and anxiety. And then an increased stress and anxiety can drive hypersensitivity of immune responses to your skin and also uh, reduces your immune system's ability to deal with pathogenic organisms on the skin. So that gives them uh, a leg up in terms of uh, producing toxins and creating damage to the skin. So the use of things like phthalates in you know, perfumes and fragrant lotions and soaps and all that can actually lead to your skin being more susceptible to things like um, acne, eczema, rosacea, and so on, right? So, so, so the environment and the things that you apply in and around your skin has a huge impact. Climate has an impact as well. So whether you live in the desert or you live in a, a very you know, um, high rainfall area, those things can have an impact. Cosmetic use has an absolute impact. Diet has a huge impact on the skin, hormone function, immune function, lifestyle, gut health, and so on. Um, and the ecological disruption to the skin ends up being the primary insult 
that then starts to alter the appearance of the skin and eventually lead to skin aging and then leakiness in the skin or what I would call a, a major skin disorder, right? So remember that the aging of the skin or the inflammatory responses and all that occur before the skin becomes very leaky and damaged. Those are early on symptoms that your skin is moving in the wrong direction. It's no different than in the gut when your gut starts to get messed up and your microbiome of your gut is, is leading towards a uh, profound leaky gut. Some of the early symptoms are indigestion and gas and bloating and distension and chronic diarrhea, all of these primary GI symptoms the you can equate those to things like acne, uh, eczema, inflammation, hyperpigmentation, fine lines, and all that on the skin, right? So those are early symptoms of dysbiosis on the skin, thereby a change in the functionality and appearance of the skin, which will then eventually lead to profound leakiness in the skin, right? And so what happens then when the skin is leaky? The The important thing here to understand is as this tripart system, right? You've got the microbial community on the skin that are sitting on the host cells. And you've got different types of host cells within the skin, but you've got a microbial community sitting on the host cell. And then you've got an immune system that's constantly monitoring how uh, everything's functioning and what's happening on the outer layers of the skin. Now, the microbial community can communicate with and impact the host cell and the host cell in turn can communicate with and impact the, the immune system to respond in one way or the other. And then the immune system has an impact on the host cell, which then has an impact on the microbial community. So it's this constant communication cycle. And then the microbial community can directly speak to the immune system as well, especially dysfunctional microbes that can produce toxins on the, on the skin that, that end up recruiting the immune system to the site of action or beneficial microbes that can produce chemical uh, signatures that tell the immune system to stand down and not overreact, right? So all of those communications can happen. So this is the, the, the tenant of leaky skin. The, le the tenant is this, that if the microbial community becomes overtly disrupted over time, that community starts to impact the host cell in a very negative way by uh, driving oxidation, right? So producing pro-oxidants by not balancing the functions of the skin, like the turnover of the skin or antioxidant activity or stopping senescence. And I'll talk about some of the, what these things mean uh, in the subsequent slides. But, but the microbial community has a dramatic impact on the host cell. The host cell then calls and recruits the immune system to the area. The immune system shows up and it's the innate immune system that shows up. So the first thing it does is kind of atom bomb or bombard everything in the area. Keep in mind that the immune system has two distinct parts, the innate, which are the fast actors that are non-specific. They just show up and they kind of blowtorch everything. And then the adaptive immune response, which is much more specific to the absolute trigger that's causing the problem, right? But in most of these cases, when the microbiome and the microbial community on the skin are very dysfunctional, you're recruiting a lot of the innate immune actors all the time. This is why the skin starts to be, look red and sensitive. And then the action of the immune system starts to damage the skin cells, including the collagen fibers, the elastin fibers, the actual barrier cells of the skin, the ceramide layer, all of these things that are the structure and function of the skin. And thereby you start to dismantle the actual structure of the skin. So imagine you've got a brick wall, right? And that's your skin. And that's the structure of the skin. On the other side of the brick wall is somebody taunting these, these overreacting guards on one side of it. They're taunting them with words and things like that. And then these guards in response to that are just hurling big boulders towards a brick wall in an attempt to kill whoever's taunting the, the, the guards on the other side. In that attempt, they're also breaking the wall and damaging the wall, right? That's what the innate immune system is doing to the host cell in response to the dysfunctional things that the dysfunctional microbial community is, is driving, right? So that process going on for a period of time causes lots of disruption to how the skin functions, how the skin looks, and then eventually to the barrier structure of the skin, thereby the skin becoming leaky. 
Now things leak through the skin, enter into circulation, and create chronic low-grade inflammation, right? So all of this kind of information has really been illustrated through this large-scale longitudinal study called the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging. This is a bit of a scientific revelation, right? Because these researchers who studied aging in a very unique way have discovered things that were previously completely unknown and even counterintuitive in many ways. So normally the way researchers study aging is they might take a cohort of like, you know, 80 year olds on one, uh, on one hand, and then they might compare them to a cohort of say 20 year olds or 20 or 30 year olds. And then they'd look at biological systems and cellular function and mitochondria and all of these things to try to understand what is the difference between somebody who's, who's aged a lot more versus somebody who's much younger. The problem with that is it doesn't really compare apples to apples because these 80-year-olds went through very different thing, things in their 20s and 30s than the current 20 and 30-year-olds are going through, right? So you're not really comparing apples to apples. So what these researchers decided, this was 60 years ago almost, that they're going to take young individuals in their late 20s and they're going to follow each individual over the next 40, 50, 60 years and look at all of their choices, lifestyle, conditions, all of that stuff, and how all of that correlates with their with the disease states and aging and, and chronic disease risk and mortality that they experience, right? So they got a lot of really fascinating data that, that is predictive of what is actually going to drive chronic disease and mortality in individuals. And what they found was that weathered or unhealthy skin is emerging as a major risk factor for almost every single age-related condition right, from Parkinson's to type 2 diabetes. So weathered and unhealthy skin is emerging. It's as an independent major risk factor for all of these age-related conditions. And we're not talking about conditions that are skin-specific. We're talking about things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and type 2 diabetes. And in, in further cases that they looked at, bone density, neurological development, cardiovascular disease, right? So imagine your aging skin is a driver for cardiovascular disease, right? That is not an intuitive connection at all, but it really highlights the system's biology that are amazing connected system uh, functions in, right? So how is that connected? Well, your aged skin represents a microbial dysfunction and change on the skin, thereby the skin is now unhealthy. As a result, the skin has a barrier dysfunction. So now the skin is leaky. So now things like toxins from microbes that are sitting on your skin or toxins from the outside environment, all the pollutants and all that that we are exposed to, most humans are exposed to somewhere around 80,000 chemicals on a uh, on a regular basis from all of the personal care products, pollutants, all of the things that we use around us, all of those chemicals and all that now have access into our circulatory system as a result of our skin barrier being compromised, right? So those things are, dr are, are passing through the skin, entering into circulation and driving systemic inflammation and toxicity. That's how the skin and a dysfunctional skin can have a huge impact on your overall health on the inside because systemic toxicity and chronic low-grade inflammation are the, uh, the, the foundations of chronic disease. Now we're coming, coming to understand that a leaky skin is a major source of chronic low-grade inflammation, right? So beyond the skin not looking the way we want it to look, it's now an independent risk factor for our overall health. And this is the part we have to wrap our brains around. And this is why I was emphasizing earlier that I really want people to start thinking about their skin as an organ they need to protect. And how they protect it is not by a veneer of making the skin look healthy or, or pure healthy. We want the skin to genuinely be healthy, especially from the microbiome level on up, right? This is a very important aspect of our overall health, just as we would protect our gut, we would protect our hearts with supplements, our brains, everything else, we need to protect our skin as well. Now, here's a here's the thing, the, the, the common misnomer when you see data like this 
is that, well, the skin is a reflection of an unhealthy insight. I would have thought that myself, right? But when you dig into the data, what the researchers are finding is that aged skin drives chronic disease risk, which means in all of these individuals that they followed, the aged skin preceded the pathologies internally that could lead to disease. That means the aging of the skin happened first. It was not that the inside is unhealthy and that's reflected on the skin. It's that the unhealthy skin caused the unhealthy inside, right? So that is really important and profound. And, and it may be hard for you to wrap your head around the condition that you may be dealing with internally as an internal dysfunction may be driven by skin issues, right? That you're having, that your skin is not acting like a barrier that it's supposed to, or at least the skin is playing a role in propagating the problem. So we have to start thinking about our skin as another one of those targets of healing opportunities and protection against chronic dysfunction. Here's a few examples of how skin uh, microbes on the skin affect uh, conditions. And also, um, what microbes on the skin are doing in terms of maintaining healthy appearing skin and then at the uh, eventually um, aged skin as well, right? So if you look at eczema and atopic dermatitis, it's very clear that pathogenic bacteria, especially Staphylococcus aureus, is responsible for driving some of the stimulus that leads to eczema or atopic dermatitis. This is a pathogen that, that all of us have on our skin, but the pathogen is typically controlled by a competing bacteria called Staphylococcus epidermidis. That bacteria and lots of the other beneficial commensal bacteria, including some of the quorum sensing transient bacteria, tend to control this microbe. But when this microbe goes out of control, it has a profound effect on your skin and your immune system and can cause issues like eczema or atopic dermatitis. Same thing with staph aureus, uh, sorry, same thing with psoriasis, uh, which is also um, um, impacted by staph aureus, but also by streptococcus and corneum bacterium, right? That's another, two other groups of bacteria that can have an impact on your skin that leads to the formation of psoriasis. We also know that acne is commonly driven by certain types of a commensal and but sometimes pathogenic bacteria called cutibacterium acnesis on the skin. Individuals with a high level of the serotype of cutibacterium will end up with acne-like lesions on the skin, right? Um, and then we know that aging, there's a profound change to the microbiome of the skin in individuals who experience aging of the skin, which we all do, right? Aging in the skin is driven by an increase in corneum bacterium and a lowering of propionin bacterium, right? So if you remember earlier, when we were talking about the ecosystem of the, of the facial skin, uh, propionin bacterium is the highest propensity of microbes on the skin because they do well in a, in a high oil, high fat, and anaerobic environment, which is what a healthy face and neck looks like. But as that starts to change, as you start to get less oil production um, in less anaerobic environments, you start to see an increase in corneum bacterium, right? And then that increase in corneum bacterium drives even less oil production and even fewer anaerobic environments because the corneum bacterium wants to shift what that ecosystem looks like to favor itself. So imagine that we start the trigger of switching the microbial population by the things we're doing, right? We're over sterilizing our face, we're washing it too often, we're using um, soaps that have all kinds of uh, phthalates in it and, um, and, and has parabens and um, you know all of these antimicrobials in it. So we're starting to kill off some of the good bacteria, we're stripping all the oil off our skin, which then removes a lot of the anaerobic environments. We're doing too many chemical peels. We're doing too many, too much exfoliation. We're using, um, you know, toxigenic uh, cosmetic products that drive oxidative stress, all of these things. And then, of course, we're stressed. We're not eating well. All of those things start to shift the microbes on the skin from propionin bacterium to corneum bacterium. Then the corneum bacterium go, hey, we're starting to get a foothold here. Let's drive the shift even further because that corneum bacterium wants this to be their new home, right? So they start lowering sebum production. 
so they so you produce less oils the skin starts to get drier you have more less anaerobic environments it starts lowering hydration because it can break down the ceramide layer and allow more evaporation of of uh, moisture from the skin so your skin starts to get drier and it can increase immune function in the skin because all of this shift in microbes is going to trigger your immune system to show up and then start creating a lot of redness and sensitivity and then eventually damage because the immune system is bombarding that area with all kinds of things that create inflammatory damage to the host skin cells, right? So we trigger some of the change, but then as the change starts to happen, the, the microbes push the change further and further because they're trying to establish an environment that works for them, all right? So these types of shifts start to create uh, cutaneous microbiota um, alterations. You start getting fewer and fewer anaerobic environments and lower and lower propion and bacteria. This drives more imbalance. This causes further aging and loss of barrier of the skin. And then eventually when your skin loses its barrier function or diminishes it quite a bit, gets further age, it doesn't have the capability of being resilient. It doesn't have the capability of protecting the host against negative stimuli on the skin. Things like UV radiation or blue light irradiation or chemicals or the environment or stress and so on. So UV radiation, for example, we know as we get older, we have become, we become more and more sensitive to the sun, right? The impact of the sun or how easy we burn increases as we get older. Why is that? Well, that's because we're, we're losing resilience on our skin and we're seeing the shift that I'm describing here. And as you end up with more corneum bacterium, you end up with more sensitive skin and less resilience on the skin itself, right? So a healthy uh, skin microbiome does a lot in order to protect the skin. For example, a balanced skin microbiome prevents the overgrowth of pathogens and prevents their toxin production, right? So at the end of the day, your skin is resilient and it tends to have very low levels of inflammation and a very high tolerance for negative stimuli. Your skin can deal with things, but uh, and that's if you have a balanced, healthy skin microbiome. You also end up having um, adequate protease enzyme, which helps turn over the top layer of the skin, the stratum corneum, which is the dead layer of the skin. You want that turning over, you want new fresh cells coming up, and you want your skin to look glowing and healthy. The production of these, this enzyme protease from your skin microbiome is really important to turning the skin over. So then your skin repairs fast. If it does get damaged, it has a high glow, it looks fresh and appears thicker, right? Um, now, you also have a bunch of microbes in your skin that produce lipase enzymes, and this effectively breaks down and regenerates the lipid layer. So as oils are coming up on your skin, and remember, the oils in your skin are trapping a lot of the toxins that, that come in through the environment, those oils need to be digested and broken up so that you can evaporate them off or wash them off your skin and get rid of the toxins of the oil bound. And so you've got mi microbes on the skin that produce an enzyme that breaks down the oils. And that allows your skin to look and maintain moisture because you're generally producing more and more of the oil layer that holds the moisture in. You're creating a stronger and more resilient barrier to the skin that protects bacteria from translocating and protects from toxins translocating as well. You're resistant to water loss and you get proper function of coll uh, collagen and elastin fibers. All of this turnover and the breakdown of the, of the fatty acids and the lipid layer of the skin is part of the stimulus for the skin to keep cycling and regenerating itself. Um, you also have microbes on the skin that produce urease, which is another enzyme uh, that, that can create free fatty acids by breaking down some of the, sera, uh, the, the uh, sebum and the fatty acids that are being produced in the skin itself. And the urease releasing free fatty acids is really important to the regulation of the pH of the skin. So this allows the microbes to maintain an acidic pH on the skin. Now, this is really important because pH balance on the skin is critical for preventing fungal and yeast overgrowth, right? So the skin should be a little bit acidic. And the way you maintain that acidity is the microbes that produce the urease enzymes that release free fatty acids from oils. Those acids acidify the skin and prevent the growth of fungus and, and mold on the skin. 
This also preserves collagen and elastin fiber function because those proteins function better in a slightly acidic pH. If the pH goes up too high, then those proteins start to fall apart and they don't function in the same way that they do, thereby making you more susceptible to fine lines and wrinkles. And so overall, it maintains youthful skin. It prevents sagging of the skin and it, uh, and it also prevents the growth of fungus on the skin. The last thing is, um, you know, the quorum sensing microbes and the biofilm production producing microbes. These are some of the transient microbes that can come on and effectuate some of these um, these functions. They maintain a healthy balance on the skin and they drive antioxidant function by quenching free radicals. Right. One of the things that one of the things that the skin is heavily exposed to is free radical damage. And that comes from all of this UV and other radiation, because the effect of radiation on the skin is the production of superoxides and oxidants. Right. And so your melanocytes, this, these are the cells that produce melanin, produce melanin, which is an antioxidant compound to try to absorb some of that radiation or absorb some of that pro-oxidant function, right? So melanin is a very important component impact in protecting the skin. However, if the skin microbiome is unhealthy, then there's no microbiome interfacing with these pro-oxidants and then pr pr uh, providing a, a protective barrier for the skin, thereby your melanocytes that are producing the melanin take the brunt of the hit and the melanocytes are very susceptible to something called senescence. Senescence is where uh, cells, any cells in the body, end up becoming zombie cells, meaning they get aged and they get damaged. They don't turn over, they don't die, and then regenerate a new cell. They just get stuck in a certain me metabolic mode. In the case of a, of a melanocyte, they're producing melanin constantly, right? So this is how you end up with age spots. And that's why they're called age spots, because it occurs with aging skin, where you're getting senescent zombie melanocyte cells that are sitting there and constantly producing pigment uh, because they're no longer turning over and dying like they're supposed to. But your microbes, the healthy microbes on the skin can actually drive these zombie melanocytes into turning over and dying and, and stimulating the release of new melanocytes. Right. And then it also prevents oxidative damage. So microbes in your skin are very important in terms of producing antioxidants to protect the oxidative stress on the skin. So now what happens to your skin when your skin microbiome is dysbiotic? Right. You've got overgrowth of pathogens. These pathogens produce high levels of toxins, which then recruits immune cells to that part of the skin. As a result, that part of the skin becomes red become sensitive, irritated, and become susceptible to conditions like eczema and acne and so on, right? And that becomes a clear appearance on the skin. You also have microbes that are not producing enough protease enzymes. So you're not getting the protease enzyme, your skin does not turn over adequately, and you get a big accumulation of damaged skin cells on that topmost layer. This makes your skin look dull and thin and, uh, and unhealthy. Right? This is why skin can look dull and thin. And then you also get a loss of the ceramide and lipid barrier. Right, So the skin loses moisture quickly, becomes leaky. Microbes and toxins migrate through and drive inflammatory responses on the skin and systemically as well. This is where you get skin that looks dry and irritated. And then you have yeast and fungal overgrowth on the skin because you don't have the adequate microbes to manage the pH of the skin, and that reduces um, collagen and elastin function as well. So now you get fine lines, wrinkles, and fungal overgrowth on the skin. And then finally, your skin becomes very susceptible to oxidative damage and accumulates free radicals. UV and other stimuli drive more senescence, especially in melanocytes, which leads to lots of discoloration and hyperpigmentation on the skin. So when your skin is dysbiotic, all of these features on the right-hand side become more and more apparent and more and more prevalent across your entire skin type, whether it's your face, neck, body, or all, right? So um, it's not actually the end of the slideshow. So let me go back now to what I wanted to show you. Okay, so um, we developed the sieve product as a way of developing a transient quorum sensing microbe 
that can hop on the skin for a period of time and create a functional change on the skin, uh, both by altering the microbes on the skin in a favorable way, but also altering the immune response on the skin, right? And we had a very uh, confident and strong hypothesis that if we could do that, if we could alter the microbes on the skin, um, that we could profoundly alter the function and thereby the appearance of the skin as well. And not only are we going to alter the function and appearance in a very favorable manner, um, the skin is going to look healthier and appear healthier, but it will genuinely be healthier. And eventually that's going to help leaky skin and all of the other issues that come along with it. Now, in the past, I've shown a lot of data around um, acne and, and uh, uh, redness and discoloration and tone and all that. I'll show you that as well briefly, but I wanted to start here with some of the latest data we've accumulated uh, through this Vizia skin analysis imaging system. So a lot of skin professionals are using these very high-tech imaging systems that look and see things that the naked eye cannot see and quantify and measure them. Right. So in particular, here's a, here are some of the measures that this system looks at. It looks at your spots uh, and it looks at both brown and red spots. Right. Uh, and, and those spots are all indicative of oxidative damage, damage to the cell layers of the skin in that area, potentially the, the, the home of certain pathogens. And those are certainly going to be areas of the skin that over time age in a much more rapid fashion. They also look and quantify fine lines and wrinkles. They can actually tell you the, uh, quantitatively how many wrinkles you have. They can look at the texture of the skin. So is the skin uniform? Is it, is, is it, uh, is there a lot of pits and things like that? Um, is it smooth, right? That's a very important aspect of youthful young skin. They look at the pores. So they can look at the size of the pores, uh, the, the number of pores, the visibility of the pores. Those are all things that are very easily visualized by the system. Uh, they look at UV spots, all of the areas of damage where there's a significant amount of irradiation damage under the skin that eventually will become things like age spots, hyperpigmentation, sites of other more complicated dysfunctions on the skin. They look at brown spots and red spots, as I mentioned, um, and then they look at porphyrins as well. So they can look at the formation of these toxigenic proteins on the skin. So they can look at all of these things individually, but then they also an analyze all of these features and then they can age your skin compared to other individuals of the same biological age, right? So they have massive cohorts of data of people within a given biological age range and they, and they can quantify what all of these dysfunctions should look like at a given age. And then they can compare your skin age, your true skin age, to your biological age based on that cohort, right? So that's the system here. And we were able to run a handful of individuals with the support of this clinic, of this esthetician and skincare clinic um, to give us some data on what the CIV is doing. So here's client number one. She used the skin, uh, the CIV biome balancing serum for 30 days. She improved her skin age by three years in that 30 day period, right? She was already more youthful than uh, the average individual of her actual chronological age. Her actual chronological age is 43, right? And, and her, her skin at baseline was measuring as uh, a true age of 38. But after 30 days of using SIV, you, looking at all of those measures of pores, fine lines, wrinkles, um, spots, UV damage, and all of those things, her age improved by three years right? That's a huge improvement in a 30-day period. Now, if you look at client number two, also used it for 30 days, she saw a two-year improvement. And it's harder to improve your, your skin as you're younger, uh, but she already was, um, you know, biologically, or her skin's biological age was already younger than her chronological age. Uh, she was 37 years old, and her skin was measuring um, as 33, but after using it for 30 days, she, she reduced that by two years and she saw a, an 11% improvement on UV spots, right? That's phenomenal in a 30-day period. So UV spots occur when melanin co uh, coagulates, 
below the skin surface because of a lot of sun damage and UV exposure. And it's generally un, uh, invisible to the naked eye, but it, it leads to the formation of other unsightly issues down the road. And so the camera that they have on here can pick up these UV spots and we were able to reduce it by 11% in 30 days. Here's a client number three that uses skin biome balancing serum. One of the things that she's really conscious of are spots, darkening spots on her skin because she's of darker skin tone. So those spots are much more visible uh, to her as an individual. She saw in 30 days a 47% improvement in spots and a 10% improvement in pore size. These are huge changes to the skin. In her case, the spots are hyperpigmentation, acne scars, freckles, and so on. Uh, and then the circular surface openings on the skin, the pores, uh, which are your sweat glands, as you age, the pores become bigger and bigger, where you can actually visually see it. What we want is smaller, tighter pores that makes the skin look much more uniform and youthful. A 47% improvement in spots in 30 days, right? And then this is some of the data I've shown before. I'll just go through a couple of them. This was participant number one that was struggling with acne. And what you'll see is that this individual had elevated levels of corneum bacterium. Remember, that's the group of microbes that increase as your skin starts to age becomes more dry, inflamed, and so on. So from, from baseline, we saw a 2.72% prevalence of corneum bacterium. We, we reduced that significantly to 1.6, which is great for his skin. Uh, but more importantly, he had almost a 60% prevalence of cutie bacterium acnesis, and this is a problematic version of cutie bacterium acnesis. We know that because it caused lots of inflammatory lesions on his face. And in, and in just 30 days of, or sorry, 14 days of using the sieve, we see cutie bacterium magnesis dropping from almost 60% down to 13.2%. That's a huge change in this potential driver of acne on an individual. So as a result, you see that his skin improved quite dramatically, right? It went from being red with a number of red angry lesions to being completely clear with no more inflammatory lesions on his skin at all. And then you see around his nose and other areas in the baseline, it's also inflamed. All of that area has cleared up as well. Here, so that functional, yep. So I just got to interrupt you. I'm so sorry. I have people massively messaging me. Okay, Siobhan, how do I get it? So in the chat, I did put the information about how to get the SIV or the sieve at 15% off for a limited time. So Siobhan, your code does not work for the 15% off. Thanks, Diane. Okay. So uh, Isabel and Morgan, if you guys can check that, um, that is a good thing to try to figure out. So they will let us know in the chat, but back to you, Kieran, the results are phenomenal. Everybody's results are going to be totally different, but mm -hmm. it, look, can you imagine what a relief and knowing that you're not taking like some biologic anyway. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. Tell people that. Bye. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and I'll end at the end of these pictures and then we'll, we'll answer some questions as well. Um, you know, again, more improvement in hydration levels, skin tone, texture, clarity. I, I love cases like this because it, this is a 10 day change in, in this individual's really inflamed, um, lesions around the mouth. And of course, you see the texture and the tonality of the skin as well. All she used was sieve and sunscreen. And in a 10-day period, you see a massive amount of change. This is the impact of shifting the microbiome of the skin. This is why we can see such profound changes, because it's the microbes that control the outcomes on your skin. And that is the point we want to keep driving home. Same thing here, very inflamed, very red um, and, and aggravated skin, a huge improvement in a 90 day period on this individual, right? And improving not only in the, in the obvious um, lesions, but then the, the uh, improved clarity and tone as well. Same here, improved lesions, improve, improved clarity and tone, reduce the redness, all of the uh, lesions as well. Um, and then here's a, here's a great example. And this is one that I want to illustrate because she doesn't have acne. She doesn't have lesions and all that on her face. But look at the tonality of her skin, right? At baseline, her skin is a very red undertone type of complexion. 
Um, fortunately, she doesn't have any lesions and all that. But what's clear is that the microbes on her skin are driving a lot of innate immune response. Now, eventually, that'll start damaging her skin, and she'll be much more susceptible to accelerated aging of the skin as a result of all of that immune activity on the surface, right? And then when, when you add the sieve, over a period of just two weeks, look at the complete change in the tonality. These pictures are taken in the exact same um, camera setup at an esthetician at a, at a professional clinic. This is why you see the, the black background there in the same exact lighting. But this is indicative of what happens when you shift the microbiome of the skin and you stop recruiting the immune system to the surface of the skin. More and more examples of this. This is a very important example because this is actually a fungal overgrowth uh, in his beard. It's the same thing if you have fungal overgrowth in your scalp and other part, parts of your body. Um, this is this is a uh, a form of uh, fungal overgrowth that leads to lesions, dry flakiness in the skin, lots of itching and irritation as well. In just two weeks, completely gone. Right. And look at the redness and all that on the side of the bridge of the nose. That part is gone as well. And you see the tonality of the skin has changed completely as well. Again, the power of balancing the microbiome of the skin. So we've also done a big study around 317 subjects, amazing results on hydration, youthfulness, and so on, redness and inflammation of the skin. 90% of the subjects reported all of these improvements on the skin in a 317 subject study. And it's really important that we also prove that the product is non-comedogenic, meaning it doesn't form comedones. It doesn't form lesions on the skin. Um, this is a very important human study to ensure that the product is safe and does not irritate anybody's skin. On top of that, and this is with 30 healthy volunteers, uh, patchwork exposure to the skin and so on. We also looked at things like um, sensitivities on the skin, right? So we recruited uh, 100 individuals, 50% of the people with very sensitive skin, and then all skin mixed types, so dry skin, normal skin, oily skin, and so on in a six-week patch test where these individuals are exposed for 47 to 71 hours on high doses of the sieve. And we're really looking at sensitivity responses, uh, you know, formation of rashes and all of these things, right? And we found that it's non-irritating, it's dermatologically approved, suitable for all skin types, it's allergy tested, clinically proven, all of these wonderful things. So it's not going to have any negative effect on anyone's skin. It's absolutely safe for all skin and hyperallergenic. Using the quorum sensing technology, right? We're rebuilding the resilience of the skin. We're balancing the biome. Uh, and then we're reversing some of the age-related dysfunction of the skin that has already started to happen in most people, right? So that's a really important factor. So um, this is what the product looks like. This is the formulation. It basically has three fatty acids that are skin mimetic. Uh, there's nothing else in it except the three fatty acids and the spores. And these are the special spores that are uh, quorum sensing spores on the skin. Um, there's no preservatives in it. There's no fragrance. There's no colorations, any of that. It's absolutely clean and pure and pristine, and it's great for the skin. So at home, here's the simplest way to use it. You clean the skin. If you're using a toner, add a toner. Then you add the biome balancing serum, and then you add your moisturizer, SPF, uh, whatever else you may want to add onto the skin. You do this once a day. Some individuals may see benefit in doing it twice a day. Another use of it is you use it at night before you go to bed, after you clean your skin. But the next day, when you wake up in the morning, you wash your face, you're going to put on makeup. Makeup can have a negative effect on the skin. You can actually use sieve as a primer for applying makeup. It actually works amazing as a primer. And then here you have a barrier that protects your skin and the makeup is sitting on top of the barrier. Right. So you're you're giving your skin some protection against any sort of damage that all of those cosmetics and the makeups and makeup and all that can do. And then once you get home in the evening, wash that makeup off, clean your face and then put the sieve on as well. So we need to do these types of things to start protecting the face. And the way you put the sieve on is you just shake it up and I'll, I'll show you once we uh, get get out of the screen share. Oh, here's a code Siobhan 15. Hopefully 
Uh, Morgan and were, Isabel. Were, are gonna I, typed, I typed it wrong. So okay. the chat, correct. And then use uh, temporarily. It's not always 15% off. Go ahead, Karen. Keep going. Yeah. So so let me get out of my share and then we can answer some questions. Yeah. And I'll show the product itself. I've got it right here. It, this is my most recent treat. Okay. One thing is shake it. You want to shake it, shake it, shake it. You need to get those yep. little guys moving around. Um, I've got a couple of questions. How does it help old acne scarring? Yeah. You know, so so old acne scarring will probably be hard to to shift, right? Because yeah. your skin is now settled. You've 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 developed the scar. The scar is really all the keratin and things like that that your skin deposits in order to try to protect the barrier. Um, you're probably not going to change the scar much. However, it's if your skin scarred as a result of acne, your skin probably has a propensity to continue to scar by others negative stimuli. So you do want to reduce the, the risk of scarring by improving the resilience of your skin so that you continue to use it and it's going to reduce the risk of scarring from anything else. Now, the other thing it can do is improve the tonality of your skin that may make the scars less clearly appearing, right? So you can improve the, the tonality of your skin, the, the hyperpigmentation, the clarity, the pore size, all of those things make your skin look a little bit more uniform and that might actually minimize the appearance of the scars. Okay. I just want to show you my face, like no makeup. This is it. I haven't had a facial and I don't even know how long. So this side, I just put a couple of drops on and you can see it's already like a little bit more glowy than this side. I've got no tricks happening, um, but this is the trick. If look, the other thing I just want to say is that this really works <laughs> and that it's not just clinicals, like in my own personal life, it has really, really worked. And I have used everything. I think in one of the emails I write that I've literally gotten on an airplane to fly to meet dermatologists and special mm -hmm. fancy facial ladies. And, you know, like I, I've done skincare on TV with Lauren Hutton. Uh, I've done it with other like scientists. I've done it with all kinds of famous people in between. Um, this works. You've seen the science. It was a great explanation, Karen. Thank you so much. What I'm also really shocked about, and it is the fact that it's so inexpensive. It's very yes. inexpensive for what you get. Bonnie, that is not what this whole seminar was about, about promoting SIV. He's showing you a new product that can really give you tremendous results. And he talked about how uh, older skin appearing and wrinkles, et cetera, is actually a sign of something systemically going on in your body. So don't, don't miss the plot on that one. Um, I'm going to take you to this page. Hold on real quick. And then we'll get to your questions. If Karen can hang out for just a couple more minutes, I'd so appreciate mm -hmm. it. Thanks to Megan and, um, and Isabel who have been answering questions. It's only $68 and then you're getting 15% off, which is super bonkers. Okay. That is super bonkers. That is like, I can go into CVS and get something that is not backed by all of this science and has all kinds of nasty ingredients that are banned in the United Kingdom and Europe and spend a ton more on it and not have this kind of science. Okay. Can nope. SIV help with, is it actin actinic keratosis? Keratosis. Okay. Yeah. So we, we haven't. What is that? So it's it's basically a um, a re response that your skin has. They're not 100% sure why certain people get it. It's likely the presence of a microbe on the skin that drives your skin to overreact by forming all of these keratin fibers, right? So keratin fibers in your skin is a uh, a way of your skin protecting itself from damage and protecting itself from things that could potentially enter through the skin. So what your skin is doing, and, and it's likely because of the presence of certain microbes, it's over responding with keratin. And so you get this keratinosis, which is a uh, overt production of keratin. And then you get a lot of bumps and, and all kinds of unsightly things. Now, we haven't done a study on that. However, we do have a number of individuals that have used it for that. And especially if your keratinosis is driven by the presence of a dysfunctional microbe, it can absolutely help with that. Okay. 
did the people in those studies do a gut health protocol at the same time? No, that's that's the interesting thing about it, right? So uh, many, none of those people, not in this, in the 317 subject study, they did not do a gut health protocol because that would have been too complicated to get them to do the gut health stuff and all that. Um, most of the before and afters I showed you, they did not. However, we do have a lot of estheticians that we work with that have now really embraced holistic health and they are using gut uh, modulators like the Serene Skin or the Megaspore with the sieve on the outside and they're getting even more profound results because of course a dysfunctional gut means dysfunctional immune system that immune system can have a profound impact on your skin and so if you can do a one-two punch and take care of your gut and the outside that's a much more powerful approach so right but it's amazing that they had such great results without it so obviously even without it Absolutely. Okay. Is this safe for the vulva area of menopausal women with the lichens sclerosis? Yes. Any external part of the body, you can absolutely use it. Okay. Um, I've, I've had people use it on things like ingrown hairs in the groin area and all that, and it helps tremendously. So, or if you get pimples down there, if you get, you know, um, clogged sure. pores, anything, you know, and especially from shaving, People who shave and all, they may get very irritated skin down there, lots of inflammatory bumps and so on. You can use it on those areas. All of that is actually considered external. Um, So that external use is perfectly fine. I mean, it's a Petri dish, right? You've got Mm -hmm. sweat, you've got no air, the whole bit. We all know about it. Tony, how and what does tattoo, a tattoo impact skin health, microbiome and leaky skin in the long run? Great question. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. And in fact, data is finally coming out about that. Uh, We now know that, so there's some correlative data that people with lots of tattoos have increased risk of a number of conditions. They're finding tattoo ink in places like your your peripheral glands, right? So the the ink does leach through through the, the layers of the skin in which you embed it into circulation, into the, the, um, the plasma system and so on. So it's early, but it, you know, I would have thought, and what this is probably one of my reasons I've, I've never gotten a tattoo, um, is because I would think that they do have a toxigenic impact on not mm-hmm. only your skin, but certainly internally, um, you know, because it is an ink, it's a synthetic uh, chemical that you're, you're embedding into your system. Parts of it are going to leak through into circulatory system, your lymphatic system, and so on. And now the data is coming out showing that it likely does that. Um, There's no data on how it impacts the microbiome of the skin directly, but I would say that the needling, the application of it probably does quite a bit. Okay. You don't, okay, one more thing. I got to tell you all, we have a special presentation that Karen did on vitamin D and K2 that if you purchase by 8 p.m. Eastern time, and send us the proof of purchase to, hold on, to info at SIBOSOS, info at SIBOSOS.com. That's my other website, and that's where we talk about gut health. And um, Karen did a really special presentation on vitamin D and K2. And if you pick this up before 8 p.m. Eastern time, and you send us your proof of purchase, you have to send us the proof of purchase. That's really important. Don't just say, hey, I, can you send me the course? You got to send us that. Then we will send you that class. Also, while I'm here with you all, um, remember he just started his first gut health course with mm-hmm. our friends at Rebel Health. We love those guys. They're the ones who do pretty much like when I think of, hey, who else does what you do, Siobhan? I think of them. Um, because they really are into quality and that kind of thing. Like I am an excellence in content. Here's the information about that. I'm going to pop it into the chat in case anyone's interested. It's a really special class. I think it's super affordable. And Kieran is going to do it live starting on the 10th. Yes, two, two days. So, two I think days. We're... so I asked if we could extend this because it's really closed. So just because you're here. Um, thank you for that. There you go. You're kind of getting in under the wire if you're so in- intrigued. So anyway, um, if you bought the Civ last webinar, can you please get the D? Uh, send us your proof of purchase if you can find it, and we'll hook you up, Mary, through this info at SIBOSOS.com. Sure. 
Okay, how, let's see, we got some other questions here. I said, hey, Sid, how you doing? Um, I thought urease raised pH levels, at least in the stomach and the gut. Is it different on the skin? It is because of what it's working. Um, so it's it's breaking down um, uh, fat um, in the case of the skin, so oils into fatty acids. That's a, that's a primary action of urease on the skin itself. Uh, okay, very good. Thank you. Um, okay, Gloria, I'd like to change up what I'm doing with my skin from one day to the next. Are you suggesting that this is the only skincare product to use for the next 30 days and perhaps longer? Yeah, we have people asking, like, can I put this in my rosacea cream? Can I still use my vitamin C? Yeah, so you can use this in conjunction with almost anything else, right? So um, we haven't really found anything that you you shouldn't use it with. The only things we say is, like, if you're using um, strong retinoic acids, um, you know, certainly use it apart. Or if your skin's becoming more sensitive because you're using something like Retin-A, um, then, then maybe wait till you're done with the course of that. But other than that, you can use it with any other serums on your skin. Um, you know, even if you're using antimicrobials on your skin, there are, there are people we know that were going through a, a small phase of using uh, antimicrobials to try to deal with acne. And we said, okay, if you don't want to stop the antimicrobials, you can certainly use a sieve, just use it apart from it, right? So maybe do one in the evening and one in the morning, kind of thing. But but everything else that you're doing that you feel helps your skin, you can absolutely keep doing and just add this in. Or you might find that once you add this in, you may not need to do as much to try to improve your skin. Is the product technically not vegan? I think urease comes from an animal urine, if I'm not mistaken. Vegan, not vegan. I no there's, there's no urease in the product. So we don't yeah. put any urease. The urease is what your microbiome on your skin produces Got naturally, it. right? So it, yeah. it is vegan unless you consider bacteria um, an animal. Um, <laughs> okay, so it's really how you, you think about it, but it's fatty acids and a bacteria and that's it. Yes, here it is. And by the way, a little goes a long way. Like mm -hmm. you're going to be tempted to go blip, 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 and then blip, 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 blip. Don't. Yeah. It's like three drops. Mm -hmm. I mean, I like it comes out a little bit fast, even for me sometimes. So I already did that other side of my. I did this side. I did this side, so I have to do. Yeah. No, I didn't. Oh, no, you did the yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I got to get it off your right side. side. Oh my gosh, it's so dyslexic at the moment uh, on mm -hmm. the screen, but it's really like so fast and so easy. If it had a dropper in it, like some of the other, mm -hmm. you'd use too much. You'd yeah. absolutely be using too much. Okay. Can your product help? We already know. Can your product help the acnetic keratosis post-treatment with chemotherapy cream? Mm, interesting. Um, with chemotherapy cream, I mean, I don't see why not. My, my guess is that I would use it apart from it. We don't have any experience with that. So I can't speak from experience. So just making a logical guess, I don't think it would be contraindicative, but I would say use it apart from it. I wouldn't okay. put this on and then put the chemotherapy cream on. I would say if you have to use one in the morning, use the other in the evening and separate it out that way. How quickly does your skin return to its original state or age? I got it. After good discontinuation of the pro probiotic. That's well, so the, so the idea is that you would use the, the, the product to drive your skin back to the healthiest age that it can be, right? Um, now, let's say you did that and, and you use it for 30 days or 60 days and your skin age improved five, six years and you're very happy with where that is. If you discontinue using it, probably in three, four months, you might start to see it aging again if you're continuing the behaviors that you were continuing before, which drove sure. some of the dysbiosis, right? So if you're revamping your lifestyle and, and getting rid of everything that's negative, that's exposing, that you're being exposed to, then I think you would be able to maintain that change forever. But that's probably not realistic, right? So in reality, we're all doing things and exposing ourselves to things that are harmful to our microbiome and microbiome of our skin, our gut, and so on. So having something like this is a continuous support. My guess is that after a period of time, you could probably use it intermittently. Um, I've been using it for a while. I don't use it every day uh, now. And in part, I don't, I don't remember every day. So I end up probably using it like three times a week. 
Um, <laughs> on my body, I end up using it every day, actually, funny enough, because I use a lot of lotion when I get out of the shower. And I always remember to add it to my lotion for, to use it on my body. But to use it on my face at night by itself, I end up doing that three or four times a week, not necessarily every day. Gloria, we just spent the last hour talking about what was in the product. So you can go to the page and see the ingredients. And Kieran's company uh, that he is co-founder with of SIV is the per- is the company he's making it. He's not just another pretty supermodel doing a testimonial. Okay, um, you guys, we are running out of time. We're 16 minutes over. Um, what about Vitilago? Or am I saying that right? <laughs> Yeah, vitiligo. Vitiligo is a, kind of an autoimmune condition, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's unclear what is driving that condition. Obviously, being an autoimmune condition, it's your own immune system uh, targeting the melanocytes and killing them off. So then now you're not producing melanin, you're not producing pigment anymore. Um, can the sieve help? I can't say yes or no, because we don't have any data or any experience with that. We don't know anyone that's, at least I don't know anyone that's used it with vitiligo. Theoretically, it could because it modulates immune response on the skin, but I don't want to say that with with any degree of confidence, right? Because I think I'd be I'd be um, in danger of making it up. Got it. Systemic yeast. Yep. It can help. True or false? Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Any any kind of yeast. so when you say systemic, if you mean internally, yeah. um, then that'll be a, a, a different type of approach. You would right. use something like the mega micro balance, right? From microbiome labs that I would use that internally, but if you have any surface yeast, then absolutely it'll work well for that. Okay. And then, um, how does this product differ from non-comedogenic plant oils placed on the skin? Well, this is a a set of spores Mm -hmm. that help with the transient and are transient that help with the permanent spores. So that's what he's been talking about for the past hour. Um, let's see. I'm not going to even address that one. What about body care product? Is that coming down the the pike? Do we have a body care or you just put it in your normal? I add it to my lotion. Yeah. So I put about three drops or so in a handful of lotion, mix it in and apply it. Now, if I get spots from time to time, like, you know, you get a little red spot here, bug bite there, this, that, and the other, I add it, I put a drop or two directly on there. Um, in, In the Midwest, we've been blessed with these wonderful pain in the ass mites that were a result of all of this um, cicadas that we had over the summer, right? So, you know, we had this like plague of cicadas, this like 17 year amazing plague of three different groups of cicadas that showed up. And then what followed them is all these mites that feed on the cicada carcasses. And then people are getting these very unusual bites all around their bodies that, you know, the mites are invisible. You can't see them. So they, they, and they float around in the air. So you're just walking down the street and then before you know it, there's a significant itch. And then over the next couple of days, you get a massive round rash around it, right? And so um, I was putting it on those kind of things as well. And it was helping quite a bit. So you can use it on bug bites. You can use it on mosquito bites. You can use it on any sort of inflamed, irritated area of the skin. It really helps modulate the immune response there. Excellent. Um, you send proof of purchase to info at SIBOSOS.com. I will put it back in the chat. Just keep looking um, up. You can find it, but uh, info at SIBOSOS.com. Okay. How does this, no, that's my husband. How does this product or any product help make you resolve those vertical lip lines over time? Does anything reverse those? Um, you know, it can. I mean, I, I think it depends on how deep the, the lines are, right? So at some point when the lines are really deep, you have to fill them with something like a filler in order to get rid of them. But it doesn't mean you can't regenerate some of your elastin and collagen function so the lines uh, reduce or minimize. Um, I would absolutely try this for that and then report back to us if, you, if you've seen that. Now, we do get a lot of reports of things, of fine lines, wrinkles improving quite dramatically in a relatively short amount of time. So um, I, I could say with confidence that it's going to improve lines. I don't know how much on those vertical lip lines. Okay. Um, let's see. We already co- we just covered that. Okay. Um, we talked about scars a little bit mm-hmm. that, uh, so it's not really a treatment for scars. So sorry. Uh, old, older scars, especially now, if yeah. you have a propensity for scarring, 
you can modulate that now so that other damage to your skin doesn't lead to more scarring, right? So scarring is another effect of the microbes on your skin. There are microbes that drive a dysfunctional healing of the skin uh, or, or an overexpression of something called matrix metalloproteinases, which can form scar-like repair. Um, so you can modulate that by utilizing something like this, but that's more for either very new scars or scars that may occur in the, in the near future. Okay, last one. Um, does this help with skin changes due to, it's called budesonide uh, or, and other steroids? Ah, uh, yes. So steroids, the, the way steroids really impact the skin is if you use them for too long, it thins the skin, right? So steroids will dismantle lots of layers of the, the top layer of the skin, the stratum corneum and parts of the epidermis. Um, that is the negative effect of steroids. Now, steroids can be very useful if you have bad eczema and so on. But, but a lot of dermatologists will say, use it for two weeks and then take a break for that reason. Now, in that break period, or when you're not using the steroid, or even uh, as a opposite times a day, you can absolutely add the sieve to help regenerate those healthy layers of the skin, right? So I would, I would encourage you to do that. Um, and if you have dam skin damage from steroid use, um, you may be able to recover some of that skin by utilizing something like this that favors the rebuilding of the skin and the skin microbiome like an IV for your skin. That's how they got the name. Anything about rosacea? Did I already ask you that? You didn't, but we do have a lot of cases of people using it for ros rosacea. Uh, we, we've got another whole set of before and afters that I don't have in here. Uh, we've got a couple of cases of rosacea in there. And again, rosacea, immunological response to the surface of the skin. We modulate immunological responses very well with this. Okay. Guys, we have to go. Uh, okay. Retinols, yes or no? It's just different, right? Yeah. So as I mentioned before, ret I would use it opposed, like an, at okay. opposing times right. for retinols, because right. retinols can really thin and make the skin very sensitive. So if you're using retinols, like say in the evening before bed, when you wake up in the morning, I would use this. I wouldn't use it at the same time as retinols. Okay. Does this product have an expiration? How long will it last? Um, it, I think it's at least two years. So, oh, but nice. you'll, but you'll use it in a month once you get yeah. it. So there you go. Thank you all so much. Let's put some love into the chat for Karen. Thank you so much, Karen. We so appreciate you. My pleasure. Thank you, everybody. I see uh, you. very nice comments. It's my pleasure to be able to come here and talk about this. And again, remember, your skin needs to be protected like any other organ, because when it's not protected, it's going to drive risk everywhere else in your body. So let's beautify our skin by making it healthier and then use it to protect ourselves. Uh, you know, a little bit of reprogramming on how we think about our skin, right? Amazing. Hard water, do you think it hurts the microbiome, Karen? Last thing? I, I don't think hard water does. Um, I, I think that mineralization of the water, if, if, if a lot of chlorine in the water can, um, you know, but but I actually don't mind hard water because I think it balances out some of the effect of the chlorine, right? Uh, some of these other minerals, the cationic minerals will bind to the anionic minerals and you'll get a much more buffered solution. Um, hard water feels better on my skin to me. Um, I don't think it's going to have a, a huge impact on your skin. I will say that too much cleaning, too much showering can have an impact right. on your skin, right? So So be gentle with that. You don't necessarily have to shower twice a day, every day. Okay. I've kept you 24 minutes longer than I needed to because, of course, we always have so many questions, but I want to let you go because I know you have other things to do. Thank you, everybody. Um, Love you. Bye. Thank you. You too. Take care. Take care. Okay. This is it. It's called Civ. It, by the way, you can push this little button in the back. It's just this little boop, boop. And it's, it's like not even really a button. It's just this little like trampoline and that will release it. But I've never even pushed that before. I just read it on the instructions. I just like do the dab and it comes out. This, you want to definitely shake it, okay? Because you've got to like activate them. Um, I'm so glad you all were here for this. It really has made a big difference. I have a stubborn psoriasis spot and it, nothing changes it, but this did for the much, much better. So I'm a, not to mention my face, it's helped a lot. And um 
just, I love this stuff. I'm so glad, you know, that he's done this with Isabella and Morgan. And I want to thank them for being in the Q and a box and answering so many of your questions. I totally appreciate all of you. And um, I think that's about it for now. And if you do buy be between now and 8 PM Eastern, be sure to email your proof of purchase. That's super important. Info at cbosos.com. Um, I just put the email address in the chat. So send us your proof of purchase for ordering through our link today. And I would like to give you all a bonus for doing that. Not only are you getting 15% off, but you'll also get Karen's um, class that he did with us on vitamin D and K2. Prior to doing all of this, he was in the D vitamin business. So he has some really phenomenal, phenomenal research that he shares about vitamin D and K2 and how it works. And, and the stories are, are really interesting. Michelle, I just put the link in the chat. You'll also get an email with the replay later on tonight and it will be in there too. Okay. Gorgeous skin all around. Remember, be beautiful on the inside, be beautiful on the outside. I know you are. And if uh, Joe is saying that you're trying to order, the website is cycling, don't know where it's going to complete the order. Okay. I'm so glad you said it. First of all, sometimes we do break the internet around here. Ooh, my husband's text texting me and that's his ringtone. He's so cute. Um, what is the customer service email, Isabel Morgan? Can you just tell me that again? So we can put it in the chat, in the uh, chat. In case anybody wants to, um, yeah, it's info at SIVcare.com, smiley face. So it's right there, info, it's SIVcare.com. And if you have a problem, they're there to help you. You know, like, did something get charged twice? Did you not have the order go through? Something like that. Joe, for example, they will help you. They're very responsive. And, you know, we're small teams, very small teams. We're a little boutique companies. Um, but we are very interested in having you all receive the best care and the best information and the best products at the best price. If you haven't checked out, different topic, um, Karen's gut health course from our friends over at Rebel Health. I just want to show it to you. I'll put it in the chat. It's worth clicking the link, uh, copy it and grab it. It starts live on the 10th. Today's the 8th. He let me um, sort of wiggle a little bit and let people from my community get in there today and tomorrow, even though officially enrollment has closed. But if you are interested, definitely check it out. And if you do sign up for that, you do get 29 of Karen's trainings um, that he and I have done over time. Same thing. Get your proof of purchase. Send it to info at cbosos.com. Okay. Uh, I know. Great, Katie. There is just so much information, but I love getting it directly from the source. There's just nowhere else to get this info. I love learning and sharing real health help with family and friends. God bless you, Karen. Absolutely, Katie. I feel the same way. I'm so glad you're here. Um, with that, I'm going to say thank you to everybody. Sincere and deep gratitude to all of you. I totally appreciate you so much. <laughs> Had food poisoning over the weekend, was in the hospital. Hmm, that'll make you appreciate everything. That's right. I had terrible food poisoning and am very, very glad to be here with you all. And I was worried I wasn't going to make it, but I did. It's been a lot of health crises around this house in the past couple of weeks with COVID and all of that. So just take good care of yourself, everybody, and carry some charcoal around in your purse with you. Just a couple. I had it in my purse. Thank goodness. But Thought I was having a heart attack. So I did go to the emergency room and spent 24 hours there. Just a little, little, little tidbit of personal information for staying until the very end. Um, and at the very end, after not having food for 24 hours, I got a terrible, terrible migraine. Yes, Joy, thank you. I feel so much better. I mean, I'm like, great. Um, I got a terrible migraine from lack of food because they were like, maybe we're going to take out your gallbladder. I was like, maybe you're not. Um, do you know my friend Sinclair Keneally? Anyway, long story short, at the very end, I was like, look, I'm not having any surgery today. Nothing is wrong. I had food poisoning. I am better. Thank you for taking great care of me for 24 hours. Oh my gosh. They did such a great job. However, I need food and I need some Toradol for this migraine because 
it's crushing me. Anyway, they gave it to me. Thank you, because I do appreciate drug intervention when you need it. And I had to whip out the term, I need to advocate for myself. You say that in a medical environment, and a lot of times you will get better attention because of the implications of what you're saying is like, you're not advocating for me. I need to do it for myself. And they did listen and they did get me food. Um, I had a delicious, my mouth is watering. That's so basic. That's so funny. I had delicious white rice. Like I've never tasted anything so good. And uh, some vanilla yogurt. Mwah! It was so good because I hadn't eaten in so long. I was so sick. <laughs> anyway, I am doing so great. I just want to remind everyone to keep some charcoal in your purse or in your car. You can go run into a CVS if you had to or a, gro- a you know, a, a drugstore because they carry them there and that it does help to, you know, it helps with those situations and food poisoning. And I was very, very glad that I had mine, but I also was still in so much pain that I never even considered having a heart attack before. Like that doesn't cross my mind, but the pain was so bad. Anyway, just be careful of what you eat. I thought I was fine. God bless you all. Thank you so much. Take care. And we will see you next time with more exciting adventures in healing. I've got some really great things coming up. And don't forget that February of next year, and I'm doing all of the the work now for it, um, the science and wisdom of menopause. Very excited about that. We are going to continue to get the proper information out there, bust the myths, get you what you need, get you who you need as um, the science again continues to emerge, which is really great news because they just don't teach it this level of it in medical school. How could they? They can't keep up. I get it. They're busy. You know, I'm pro practitioner, but um, you have to stay up with, with the research, which is practically impossible. So I have so much respect for everybody who's at least trying. Okay. We'll see you next time. Thank you all. Bye. 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 Bye.